what is populism and why does it work? Economic grievances and cultural resentments cannot be completely distinguished. But when people in a country, state, or city become upset, popular slogans and platitudes sound really good to itching ears. Should politicians focus on how to fix problems or how to motivate base constituents? Will populist candidates dominate the polls from now on, or will the public's taste swing back to the middle? Kathleen Murphy and Dr. Richard Ruff discuss populism on CounterPoint with Gerard McClendon. Welcome to CounterPoint. What is populism and why does it work? Is a loud voice of a few greater than the quiet voice of many? Give me a call, 844-777-9311. Hit me at Gerard MC on Facebook and Twitter. I have the communication director for the Illinois Opportunity Project, Kathleen Murphy, and professor of political science at Purdue University Northwest, Dr. Richard Rupp. What is populism? We've been hearing the P word a lot lately on TV. Populism, populism, populist. What does it mean? Well, it has a long history, actually. Um, it is absolutely front and central to the political debate today, uh, not just in the United States, but globally. And I think there are many definitions of populism. I think right at the outset, it's useful to note that populism really is not a political ideology. Populism is more of a strategy and a tactic of political communication. Mm -hmm. That might be a, a benign way of putting it. Another way of putting it is that populism is a strategy and tactic to acquire political power. And it can be of use to any of the political ideologies, liberalism, conservatism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, libertarianism, socialism. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have, so th the idea of populism doesn't necessarily wear a party's uniform. It, it, it kind of, it can kind of morph into what it needs to at that particular time for a party or for a candidate. That's a good, very good way of putting it because throughout history it has had peaks within the left and peaks within the right and clearly now in the last few years we're seeing it peaking uh, on, the, on the right uh, and we are seeing it as we've never seen it before in American politics. Speaking of seeing it as we've never seen it before, Kathleen Murphy, in the last 18 to 24 months, how has populism peaked or morphed or changed? What have you seen in the last two years as it pertains to populism? Well, I think we certainly saw the shock with Brexit. I mean, um, and that um, Britain voting to leave the EU, um, which I'm, I'm uh, somewhat skeptical that that was entirely populist. Britain's always been a little bit um, ambivalent about Europe. They consider themselves sort of extra European, if I'm not correct. mistaken. Right. So I think there was some, um, pe there was a, a feeling that they didn't want the sovereignty moved from Westminster to Brussels. Mm. Um, so I think it was more, it was, it was given more meaning because of the shock of it, but it was really just a return to the norm. I'm, for Britain, I think. and then of course there was Trump's victory, yeah. which was a reaction to a political class in Washington that um, really had gotten out of touch with its voters, said one thing in the district, went back to Washington and did what they were going to do. They, you know, protected themselves from the impact of their own policies, um, ruled as if you know the American people were too stupid to figure this out. Um, we saw it in the Republican primary. I came to it slowly. I, mean, I fought Trump through uh, Scott Walker, Carly Fiorina, yeah. Ted Cruz of yeah. all people. I, mean, 16, 17 I fought candidates. it as long as I could, but then you have to ask yourself, why are we seeing this? And it's because people, for years, for, I mean, and I'm not just talking about the Obama administration, through Clinton, through Bushes, both 40 and 42, 41 and 40, um, and what are, I don't know what they're, but anyway, we fought it through, they saw, have seen government grow larger and larger, they've seen the quality of their lives decline, and they know they want something different, they know that they, that both parties have sort of abandoned them. This is interesting, mm -hmm. because you never really, in the, mm -hmm. in politics, 
of course you're given basically an either or right. when it comes to candidacy, especially when it comes to the general elections. Right. But I want to come back to a point that you just yeah. made with Brexit and with the United States election. Professor Kathleen brings some reasons out, but was there a tipping point of sorts internationally of populism kind of rearing its head up saying, wait a minute, you know, we're not going to take this anymore? Is, is that where the voters went? Over the last, what, two years or so, internationally speaking, what do you, mm -hmm. you say? What? Well, the question goes to what, what, is, what explains the rise of mm -hmm. populism yes. it, th at this time? And it has been underway for several years uh, uh, globally, and there are many reasons. Um, one, uh, it's interesting to think about populism within liberal democracies and populism within authoritarian states. Oh. And so, because they, it, it plays a role in both. And part of it is the strain on capitalism and Western democracy in the last, say, 15 years. You're, you're seeing almost the calcified nature. I want, nature is too strong, but the calcification of the institutions that it's, a, it's recognized from a liberal uh, perspective to a conservative perspective that the institutions of government, even the institutions of capitalism, the institutions of uh, a market economy are not functioning well. Mm -hmm. And so we can all see that. Mm -hmm. um, and, this, and this then spills down to income inequality, co uh, cost of living, uh, that people are not being able to maintain their standards of living, mm -hmm. globalization. Uh, in which we see a great deal of pressures, but then we also see other issues going on. And I would talk very uh, much about the uh, rise of advocacy journalism, particularly in the United States, and how that has now been picked up overseas. Uh, when we see when we see the cable news networks, and that spills into a, a fueling of uh, the populist message, which is demonization of the two sides. Yes. Is, is that one side is rep classically the populist are we represent the good normal people, and the bad guys are those e elites in Washington or Brussels or uh, wh wherever they. They are. Yeah. Um, so, and it's, oh, go ahead. No, no. So, so let me just uh, ask you this within your answer. You mentioned authoritarian and democratic states. So, is populism different in an authoritarian type of structure as opposed to a democracy, or, or is there, or are, or is populism? Does it have the same? Uh, to use uh, uh, an expression, does it have the same cousins in a democracy or in an authoritarian it's state? It's actually it's similar uh, because one, it's the demonization of the opponent, and so that's that would be that would be a core category. Um, very simple messaging. So you're you're reaching out to a base, and your base that you're reaching out to tends to be undereducated, tends to be disenfranchised, and so you're 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 dismissing the media, you're demonizing the media, um, you are making sweeping statements about your your opponents as being corrupt. You have both domestic enemies and foreign enemies. You're not you're not particularly interested in compromise. There is a right and there is a wrong. You're in the right and they're in the wrong. So it's very polarizing. Let's talk about this, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. The doctor mentions the undereducated. The doctor mentions polarization. Mm -hmm. uh, let me let me find out how to divide two forms of people. Uh, two eth let me divide ethnicities. Let me divide you know sexual orientation. Let me divide my political uh, construct. Uh, did you see this occur? In what ways did you see this occur in the United States the last two years? Um. Well, I think there was divisive rhetoric on both sides of the aisle to, you know, tr in this last election. Um, you know, at the end of the day, women voted for Trump. Um, more minorities voted for Donald Trump than voted for Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. He did a, and not, not a lot, the Republican Party needs to do a lot better about their minority outreach, but he still was able to appeal to a larger segment of it than Mitt Romney was. So. Um, you know, I agree, but I think that still, at the end of the day, we you need to look at why this message is appealing to people, and it's because something resonates. There's something in their lives that they feel like, ha you know, 
is not being addressed by the ruling class. And if you look at Illinois, they would be absolutely right right now. You know, mm -hmm. you look at Mike Madigan. Uh, property taxes in Illinois, highest in the nation, twice the national average. Oh, in places ridiculous. like Gray's Lake, four times the national average. People are paying 48% of their home's value in property taxes, 35% of their home's value in property taxes. It's like buying a house on a credit card. It's, um, you know, there, people are being priced out of their homes in places like Cook County um, and, and, you know, across the state. But it, it, in South Cook County, people are, we're seeing abandoned homes. You're renting your home from the government, essentially. Mike Madigan, the most powerful man in the state, is a property tax appeals lawyer. He controls every piece of legislation that comes to the floor in Illinois because of the way the rules are written. Mm -hmm. He's not interested in property tax reform. He's interested in keeping your property taxes high because he benefits from it. His law firm represents seven of the 12 major buildings in Chicago Which for property tax purposes. Which should be a conflict of interest, but you know, it's the Illinois way. This is, and then, and then he has Governor Rauner who's come in and done a tepid job of opposing him and I mean he has prevented many things from being passed but he hasn't really advanced the flag almost, at all. Almost three years without a budget. And meanwhile this blame game goes on and the people in the state are losing their homes meanwhile they see they're mad at both parties. I mean this is and and they are genuinely being hurt. People are losing their jobs, businesses are leaving, People are genuinely being hurt in a way they've never hurt before. The ground is ripe in Illinois I think for a message from a candidate, which I haven't seen which one is going to do it yet, but any candidate who steps forward and says, listen, there's plenty of blame to go around. It is you and me against this Leviathan. I am on your side. That, and then do it. Run on property tax relief and then do it. And then I think that message is the one that would work. I got to close my segment out, um, but a one word answer. Mm -hmm. Do we see the rise in populism when people are upset? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Does populism go away when people are no longer upset, or does it still kind of exist? It remains. It remains, mm -hmm. just on a more subtle level, possibly. Mm -hmm. Stay with us for more CounterPoint. Tweet me, post on Instagram, or send me a message on Facebook. Let's start the conversation. Your voice is important on CounterPoint. Dr. Rupp, Repub you mentioned that Republicans are pivotal with populism. Man, a lot of alliteration there. What do you mean by that? Republicans are, have been pivotal with their populism or pivotal with their voice or platform. Well, I've been arguing for the last year in looking at the United States that in a in a country that calls itself a liberal democracy, if it only has two political parties, it's imperative for both of those parties to be committed to the values of liberal democracy. And I believe I can objectively say, in look, looking at the Republican Party, I'm very worried about the Republican Party uh, because of what I see as a breakdown in its commitment to some of those core values. When I look at the party today, um, and I was a young Republican when I was a kid and worked for Reagan Bush in California, mm. when, I look at, when I look at the party today, I don't see it articulating a political philosophy. The, the Democrats articulate liberalism and progressivism. I actually don't see Republican leaders in rank and file uh, articulate a conservative p policy. So, uh, so, so you feel that Republicans are Republican capital R meaning generic and not necessarily a Republican that's capital C or lowercase c I th conservative? I think unfortunately the Republican Party has shifted to a energy that is so focused on holding power that is more important than advocating a conservative agenda. You don't think the, the Democratic Party does that though either? I think there's a difference. There's a difference. I, I, I think that the Democratic Party with all of its flaws, mm -hmm. probably including nominating Hillary Clinton to be its standard bearer, is still a party that I can say articulates a political philosophy based on something I understand as liberalism uh, and progressivism. Whereas when I look at the Republican Party, uh, I don't see that, I don't see a coherent conservative uh -huh. agenda. Kathleen, Republicans, pivotal. You agree? Disagree? Um. Well, I mean, I I agree in this point the to the extent that. 
because they um, were concerned with, you know, they became part of the Washington establishment, did one thing in the district, said one, did another in Washington, um, didn't get health care through, said they would, you know, um, budget reform would happen, didn't happen, they didn't repeal and replace Obamacare, they said these things would happen, they worked weak and cowardly in Washington, hence we have um, Donald Trump as the nominee and eventual president. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you could say um, that the Democrat Party's principles were just as corrupted, um, that people felt that they weren't being served by the, de you know, the Democrat Party, um, hence Bernie Sanders' appeal on the left. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, I, and the Democrat Party sort of does violate its, you know, its principles that, you know, everyone should be treated fairly with you know, super delegates. I mean, right there. I mean, the, that election was definitely rigged against anyone other than Hillary Clinton. It's frustrating that we have a candidate that, we, there may be one candidate that's extremely polarizing, but it's making a definitive point. Mm -hmm. There may be another candidate who isn't definitive, but the platform is so obtuse that you don't right. know what they stand for. Right. And so I think that gives pop, a populist candidate sure. an opening. Well, and Hillary Clinton moving her position wherever the poll tested, you know. I'm talking to blacks grouped, today, so let me talk you black. Know, yes, me, you know, hot sauce was. in her purse, really? Hot sauce in her purse, you know. Oh, I know, there, yeah, and that's just, yeah, that's a whole, yeah. You know what, that's a whole other 30 minute show. Let yeah. me ask you to this, is Republican synonymous with conservative in this no. country? It's not, no. it's not that's synonymous. Not conservative, no. I, it's, um, conservatives limited government. Mm -hmm. Republicans, I agree, a lot of Republicans have gotten away with that. There's a lot of big government in bed with big business Republicans. The George W. Bush um, was certainly one of them. Mike Huckabee is another. You know, there are, there is the, um, you know, the sort of protectionist. Um, Mike Huckabee is a protectionist. Mm -hmm. A protectionist, um, meaning you know, pro labor Republicans. Um, so, not all Republicans are conservatives. It's not synonymous. Well, it's important. Conservatives to go back. are small government. It's, an, limited it's important government. to go back to note that that populism knows homes in both mm -hmm. camps mm -hmm. uh, and has a long history, mm -hmm. of, probably even even a longer history historically within mm -hmm. more of the left, particularly in say Lat Latin America. Mm -hmm. What's interesting today is that the populism today is primarily on the right uh, in Europe and the United States. And there's a, lo a lot of... Though, Marie Le Pen is basically a socialist. I mean, she is a nationalist, which Trump is also a nationalist, but she is a socialist. She's a socialist, but what makes her populist within that? Well, it's the appeal to the common man. Yeah. That's all. It's not an ideology, really. It's just this appeal which, to which the common Which he mentioned at the beginning. It's funny because I was reading the uh, the Cass Mudd article said no definition of populism will fully describe all populists. Mm -hmm. That's because populism, and Dr. Rupp mentioned this earlier, is a thin ideology. Mm -hmm only speaks to a very small part of a political agenda. And one thing that we haven't mentioned tonight is awfully important is that populists, both left and right, tend to demonize um, uh, elites, but, uh, but also demonize intellectualism, uh, experts, bureaucrats. The sense, the sense, there's a sense that if only normal people were making decisions about property taxes, if only normal people were making decisions about public policy, all would be well. well this so. is a pretty common tr uh, tactic of, of populist uh, both overseas and here that at home. That demonization is only effective because people can believe it. I mean, we have so many people now because, I, am, frankly, because of a liberal agenda that are beyond reproach. You cannot criticize, um, you know, certain groups of people. You can't criticize ideas. You can't say, you know, so I think that people feel like um, we, they believe that there is this protectionist, there is this insular class that's protecting itself against, um, you know, all these. Populism options. works because elites are failing to do mm -hmm. their job. Yeah. Republicans and Democrats are failing to do their job. And the masses are quite ignorant. Yeah. And elites who choose to be populist, but many. See, right there, that's an elitist statement. Elites, Not necessarily. Yeah. Elites well, who choose to be, this is actually the literature in the field, elites who actually use populism know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly that the masses are not particularly well-versed, not particularly well-educated. 
educated. They don't want complicated arguments that require them to watch shows like this. Okay. Because I can I can assure you, Gerard, that the uh, the voter who you want to be watching this program tonight is not watching this tonight. You don't think so? No. But are voters sheep? Do 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 are voters primarily illiterate people who no. believe no. in what? The people that no. Do do they believe in what kind of? you know, scratches their ear as opposed to something that may be an empirical fact. The American political, yeah. system, you know, do let, do the American political system let the people down this past year. That our, our political system, our establishment, is, is, is dysfunctional, and the people are going to the barricades on, mm -hmm. on the right and left, which is such an interesting phenomena that it was both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Yeah. So that was a major well, and statement. Donald Trump won in the same place as President Obama won. Donald Trump won more Obama... Um, <laughs> He did. He won in Obama's ele electorates. So he won a lot of those. Were the United States candidates, and I'll say, you know, no, no, I'm going to say all the candidates, mm -hmm. not just the candidates in the general, but were all the United States candidates in the general and the primary for running for president, was that the best that the United States had to offer? Now, I know that's a loaded statement, but really, was that the best? You know, Ben Carson, really? Bernie Sanders, Trump. Well, yeah, I'll, really, I'll speak really, on that. Ted uh, Cruz, really? I mean, yeah, Hillary Clinton, was right. that the best we had to offer? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's who's in office, who's, I, I thought that the Republican field was actually a very good Republican field. It's just the fact for the past eight years, Republicans had let, broken their promises repeatedly over and over and over again. Um, I thought Carly Fiorino was a qualified candidate. I, you know, someone like, you know, a Rex Tillerson would have maybe been a good, a better candidate than her because he had, he, he had, um, he had big oil. a lot of experience <laughs> that, you know, President Trump didn't have, so, at that point. But, um, no, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, it's a good question and it's tough to answer. It was almost it's who, insult. But it's who we had. Yeah, and that's... But the system is part of it that, that creates that. Uh, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court, fortunately, is going to hear a major case on gerrymandering. Mm. And there is no question that part of the banal conversation that we have in this country regarding politics is because our, our, um, our legislative districts are so tightly woven for either Republicans or Democrats, mm -hmm. we don't have a conversation going. That is to say, you're not bringing in a, a group of people living in the greater Northwest Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, crafted into logical geographic districts and so that Rep republicans and democrats people of a variety of uh, perspectives are in the same room with pete Vesklosky or mm -hmm. whoever else is mm -hmm. is is the congressperson and they're having a conversation where we are now we were getting so polarized because mm -hmm. our political class and it's republicans and democrats both of them totally culpable for this have created these districts that are uncontestable the other component of course is money mm -hmm. and until uh we have a conversation or until we take action and frankly open up the First Amendment and uh, consider amending the First Amendment, we will continue to have the, the role of money. If you look at the role of money in the last election, <laughs> it was defining. It was, it, was, it was defining to a point. It, it became less defining when Donald Trump sees... So. Se Donald well, Trump it, spent it, less than it, any well, other Well, that's why I was at, where I was just going, is okay. that it became, it became less defining, because I mean, you, right. like George, uh, not George, uh, Governor Bush raised a ridiculous amount yes. of money, maybe $50 yeah, million Jeff dollars Bush, and, yeah. and did no, nothing with it. But still, he, they can control the early part of the date, the debate. Mm -hmm. But no, you're absolutely right. Trump's message came in, mm -hmm. his, the entertainment quality, the, the show that he is yeah. incredibly talented at produce, producing and so money did not mm -hmm. become terribly important and again if you ask if you ask uh, a political scientists at the end of the day did money decide the election and you know, Hillary Clinton was spending just as much yeah, or, or less it doesn't it doesn't yeah. really matter yeah. and Trump commanded the news cycle with tweets right. and, and 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 his his presence became the story right. Well, and I think, and, and uh, this is just a good example of how insulated the political class really is, and there is a political class, and the media, frankly, was that they couldn't see what he saw. He heard a voice that no one else heard, and he read the electorate better than anyone else. That map was not at all what anyone expected. You no, saw the faces on CNN right. and MSNBC on election night. 
um, none of them could see it happening. Yeah. I would, that's yeah. how, that's because that's the bubble. Pennsylvania, I would, Wisconsin, I would, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton doesn't go back Hillary to... Hillary Clinton goes and I can't believe, I mean, you need Pennsylvania, major state. Um, you don't go and say you're going to put coal miners out of business and make that, you know, that was... Death Ferry goes in there. Wow. Trump's so so cool. you're saying that sometimes wins, wins we can't. Pennsylvania and everyone's awestruck. So well, sometimes we can't tell voters the truth. I would we, not say, we I would not say that Donald Trump um, listened to his voters. What Donald Trump did very effectively is activate a latent authoritarianism that is within a sadly large percentage of the American electorate. And was that attractive? What was authoritarian? Was that attractive what to was some voters to, to say, hmm? Well, we have we have pretty solid data on what voters believe, mm -hmm. and so as far as their views on race, as far as their views on diversity, minority rights, civil rights, we have very solid information about this, and we can see that what transpired in the election is that these Americans, and and this is a global phenomenon, of course, uh, uh, voters around the world have authoritarian perspectives. They're not active authoritarians in the United States. These are not people you know, getting ready to seize the moment. What, what, no, let me finish. Uh, and so what we saw happen here is that Donald Trump very skillfully understands that voter and gave them voice, gave them voice to talking about uh, immigrants gave them voice to talking about race, gave them voice to talking about crime, and so he talked to them in such a way that they became, they didn't, they weren't, he wasn't listening to them, he activated, activated. them. I got about one minute, Kathleen, rebuttal or? Um, you know, looking at it as a policy so far, I don't, no, there's not been authoritarianism, I mean, he has, um, implemented um, small government fixes to Obamacare. He has um, put forth a very traditional, conservative, um, Reagan-esque tax reform proposal. He's implemented regulatory reforms that are very typical of the Republican Party. He um, put in a Supreme Court justice that is straight out of central casting as the conservative, constitutional conservative. Um, so healthcare, directionally, healthcare. They, need to get, they need to get that replaced passed and so people can start to Behind feel. closed doors or out in the open? No, they need to do it. The Senate needs to send it back to the House, and they need to do it soon so that they can start on tax reform. Is populism here to stay? I don't think it's... Of course. I think it's been here all the time. Yeah. And I don't think it's a bad thing to challenge, um, you know, insulated ruling class elites. It threatens liberal democracy. i got to get you two back. I'm loving this. Thanks to my guests, Kathleen Murphy and Richard Rupp, call me at 844-777-9311 with your opinions. Stay positive. I need you to keep your head up and always be encouraged to voice your counterpoint.